This paper sort of came out of conversations between uh, myself, my co-author, and the National Statistical Agency. Um, we were sort of interested in, a, in the context of a highly unequal society, what would be the differences between uh, people who we measure as poor and people who perceive themselves to be poor? Um, it, it seems like a fairly sort of simple question, um, but luckily the answers are a bit more complex, which allowed us to uh, write what we hope is an interesting paper and, and to look at some of the, some of the differences. Uh, when we started, both in our discussions and, and looking with the data, we discovered what you might expect in a country like South Africa, that uh, many households that were very, very wealthy in terms of having several cars, uh, several high earners in the household, were also identifying themselves as subjectively poor. Um, there are many reasons we could think of this, and I think some of those were covered in the, in the previous presentation, but it got us to thinking more about what we were both really interested in, and that's the, the sort of overlap between objective and subjective measures of poverty uh, at the lower end of the income distribution. And in particular, uh, what does it mean when these two measures of poverty don't overlap? What can it tell us? Um, I, I can see this is a fairly non-South African crowd. Um, so I'll start with some of the sort of the context of, of South Africa. Um, it's widely documented that uh, objective rates of income poverty in South Africa um, have remained stubbornly high uh, in the post-apartheid period. Uh, we see somewhat of a modest decline in income poverty in the 2000s um, after massive investment in uh, social expenditure by the government. But there's a strong sense that uh, the dip in poverty or the, the progress in poverty reduction uh, is, is not in line with the amount of expenditure and in particular uh, pro-poor expenditure. Uh, not surprisingly then, the post-apartheid government has been uh, sort of displeased and, and very surprised by our findings in terms of income poverty. Uh, it's very hard to reconcile the uh, types of uh, spending, particularly on primary health care, education, sanitation and housing, uh, which we group broadly under the term social wage. It's very difficult to explain why this type of investment, uh, and in particular the expansion of uh, a fa fairly comprehensive uh, social grant system hasn't yielded better results in, in terms of poverty reduction. Um, in particular, government points to uh, uh, during the period where much of the debate about income poverty was happening, uh, a really incredible sort of expansion of electrification to households that didn't have it before, access to piped water, uh, and in the period in which we tend to debate uh, trends in poverty in South Africa, uh, six million South Africans uh, received government subsidized housing. So that's the one side government is sort of incredulous at our findings that uh, the reduction in poverty has been, has been marginal. Um, but on the research and academic side, uh, uh, re poverty analysts have also noted problems um, that would suggest we're underestimating household resources when we measure income and expenditure. Uh, in particular, we have uh, large numbers of missing data in some of our um, income and expenditure type surveys. Uh, implausible zero income households, uh, even in households uh, where they're employed members, um, as well as the sort of usual concerns you have with uh, um, disclosing sensitive information, all of which um, has contributed to the debate amongst academics about the possible underestimation of economic resources in the household. So the objecti objectives of this study um, are to explore an alternative way of measuring poverty where we use respondents' own perceptions uh, of economic well-being in their household. And in, we then want to learn uh, to see what we can learn about these objective poverty measures uh, when they don't overlap with subjective assessments of poverty. Um, given the sort of uh, state of the debate in South Africa, we're then interested in seeing whether the components of this um, government expenditure, uh, expenditure broadly that termed the social wage uh, affects perceptions of poverty. And then what differences between subjective and objective poverty measures, uh, whether they're consistent with the underestimation of uh, resources and households, which we suspect from the data that we have. Um, I don't need to go into too much detail here. Um, the previous presentation sort of set the stage for um, the subjective literature. Uh, and I think this crowd in particular is, is very aware of uh, the steps that are involved, the assumptions that are involved when deriving objective poverty measures. 
Uh, among other things, it requires whether you decide to use income and or expenditure information, how to adjust for non-response uh, measurement error, uh, differences in cost of living across regions uh, and groups, and differences in uh, types of households by size and, and the type of people who live in them, uh, not to mention um, the decisions that go around identifying a, a poverty threshold. Uh, the advantage then of uh, subjective assessments is they don't require these types of assumptions about how to adjust for household resources and, and, and some of the things I just mentioned. And critically, they don't depend on some sort of predetermined or expert-derived uh, threshold of poverty. Um, some of the literature has also suggested that it's easier to report than income, uh, somewhat less sensitive, uh, and there's been an argument that there's no obvious reason by, why people would not be willing to assess their own um, economic status. Um, additional advantages we might expect from a subjective measure of poverty include uh, the capturing of longer term uh, measures of, of welfare, uh, things that aren't sort of a part of current or aren't captured adequately by current income or expenditure, um, as well as a wider range of welfare components, which we would expect would include things like say, state subsidized housing, access to basic services, education, and health. There has been a, a growing uh, body of work on subjective poverty internationally, and it seemed to us that the focus was largely on not replacing objective measures with subjective measures, but seeing if there are ways to combine the two. And uh, in particular among this research, uh, one of the main themes seems to be um, calculating a subjective poverty line based on subjective assessments combined with uh, uh, objective data. Uh, however, a few studies um, are doing something uh, which is more closely in line with, with our main interest, which is the comparing subjective and objective measures and profiles and seeing if there are actually systematic differences um, uh, across a range of characteristics and what these differences might say about our traditional measures of objective poverty. So in terms of this specific body of work, which is looking at the, the differences between objective and subjective, there seem to be uh, several main conclusions. One is that it's, it's possible that objective poverty, um, particularly when using the per capita measure of income or expenditure, uh, are assigning the wrong weights, and in particular to uh, economies of scale in household spending, um, as well as the different consumption needs of different types of, of household members. Um, one of the typical findings across a range of fairly diverse countries uh, is that objective and subjective poverty rates diverge, particularly uh, with household size. Um, another reason that's put forward in the literature is the low dimensionality of the objective economic um, measure, simply meaning that income is only one component of, of uh, well-being, and subjective poverty assessments therefore widen that beyond income or expenditure. Um, and finally, returning to the point that um, there's likely uh, underestimation of objective economic welfare, income and expenditure, in a number of the surveys that we tend to use, and further suggestions that this is often exacerbated in sm with small-scale activities, uh, such as subsistence farming. Um, turning to our methods, uh, we have a recently released data set in South Africa. It's a large-scale na nationally representative survey. And for the first time in South Africa, it combines comprehensive income and expenditure information with a number of subjective well-being and subjective poverty questions. The question we use, um, arguable how it sort of compares with something like subjective well-being, is, is the direct subjective poverty question, where one member in the household is asked to assess uh, the poverty status of her or his household um, with options ranging from wealthy, very comfortable, reasonably comfortable, just getting along, poor, or very poor. Um, we then classify following the work of others, um, the poor as those who identify themselves as poor or very poor. Um, in terms of objective poverty, we include a lot more detail in this in the paper, but we use the national um, uh, poverty line of 577 rands per month per person. Um, very, very roughly, if you divided this by 10, that would give you a, a loose but very fuzzy concept of what it is in dollars. Um, and the data that's in 2,000 prices and the, the data are in, are in 2,000 prices, or sorry, 2,008. 
So our goal here is to uh, offer descriptive analysis of the ways that uh, objective and subjective poverty measures differ by characteristics. And then we conclude with an econometric analysis where holding uh, expenditure constant, um, try and identify what other characteristics uh, predict uh, a household's assessment of their subjective poverty status. Uh, this table would uh, um, sort of suggest that there's a very high degree of overlap um, between uh, subjective and objective measures. Uh, I just hold it down. So about 49% of households are neither subjectively poor uh, nor objectively poor, and about 20% of households are both objectively and subjectively poor, which means that about 69% of all households have the same objective and subjective uh, poverty status. As we would expect, there seems to be some sort of uh, linear uh, sort of relationship between uh, average income, or in this case expenditure, based on these uh, sort of categories. So households that are um, both objectively and subjectively poor are far below the poverty line of 577. Households that are objectively poor but don't perceive themselves as poor, slightly better off, and then the uh, relationship with uh, expenditure increases beyond that. So among all households that are identified as objectively poor, 60% uh, uh, self-assess themselves as poor. I, I don't know if there's uh, too much points in comparing with other contexts which use different questions, but it seems that this overlap is slightly greater than in, than in other papers that have, that have looked at this. Of those 40%, um, who we measure as poor but don't assess themselves as poor, uh, most of them identify themselves as just getting along, which is, I think, what we would expect. Uh, this table, then, uh, I would suggest would represent our uh, headline finding. Um, so if people asked us, well, what's the subjective poverty rate versus the objective poverty rate in South Africa, um, we would say that 33.8% of uh, households in South Africa are below our poverty line, and there's a big jump in terms of proportion of individuals. 47% of individuals live in poor households, which sort of follows the conventional wisdom that poor households uh, tend to be larger. If we look at subjective poverty, it's significantly higher overall in terms of households. 37% of households are subjectively poor, and a slightly smaller percentage 39.5% of individuals are subjectively poor, suggesting really that there's a big difference between um, household size and objective and subjective poverty measures. So if the question is asked, are South Africans subjectively poor, more likely to be subjectively poor than objectively, it would certainly differ uh, depending on whether we're talking about households or individuals. So this graph sort of gives a representation of, of what happens uh, as household size increases uh, in terms of the incidence of, of poverty. So with very small households, uh, the red line are, is subjective poverty. Um, the level, the incidence of subjective poverty is much higher in small households. It declines, so there's some sort of convergence uh, between households with three or four members. Thereafter, for both objective and subjective poverty, uh, the risk of poverty increases. But far, far more dramatically, the, the line is steeper uh, for objective poverty. So we can see what we've found in other studies, that uh, there seems to be some sort of difference between objective and subjective measures with household size. Uh, in addition, uh, when we're talking about the share of household members, uh, uh, which are under the age of 11, households with no children are far more likely to be object subjectively poor than objectively, and then it increases as the, uh, the risk of poverty increases in uh, both poverty measures uh, as the share of children increases. But again, the increase is much steeper uh, for objective poverty. So it seems that the relationship between uh, the proportion of children in the household and poverty is stronger in objective measures. Uh, we were also interested in a number of other uh, characteristics which we um, sort of hypothesized things and, and also considered in the literature. Uh, the first of which is uh, what type of area um, are households based. So subjective poverty is 
is higher than objective poverty in all areas except for tribal authority areas where objective poverty is higher. This could be for a number of reasons. It could be due to limited horizons associated with relative deprivation. Or in the South African context, this denotes households that are deeply rural and far more likely to be uh, subsistence and agricultural based. We can explore this further. Um, households with uh, land for farming um, have far higher objective poverty rates than households that don't. Again, this is a proxy for households in, in rural areas. We see the same for subjective levels of poverty, but the difference is much smaller. And then overall, households with access for land for farming uh, are much more likely to be objectively poor than subjectively poor, perhaps an indication that access to land for subsistence activities is, is a protector of, of subjective poverty. Uh, we do the same for the uh, access to a dwelling and find the same results, but keeping in mind ownership of dwellings in South Africa is often representing ownership of shacks and informal types of homes, not the types of homes um, you would imagine in other contexts. Uh, so what we wanted to do then was to uh, uh, estimate two probits um, to where we're looking at the, the predictors of subjective poverty. Um, it's, it's a binary outcome. Uh, our variable of interest is, of course, uh, per capita household expenditure normalized by the poverty line. And we control for a, a group of demographic income generating characteristics, asset characteristics, uh, variables grouped under the social wage as well as the local income, average uh, expenditure in the district, which is as close as we could get for a reference group, as well as the, um, the Gini coefficient for uh, the district. In the first regression, uh, we control only for uh, characteristics of the household. And in the second, we were able to work with the data agency to identify which household member uh, was reporting on subjective poverty and providing the assessment. So we control for their characteristics as well. Uh, before we get to the full regressions, uh, we did a, estimated a reduced model controlling only for household size and household composition. And we found that the significance uh, in the model on household size and share of children disappeared with an economy of scale parameter of 0 0.42 and uh, um, child cost ratio of 0.5 for younger children and 0.9. So we find that compared to the poverty literature in South Africa, we find a much stronger uh, effect of economy of scale, suggesting that this is underestimated in, in existing poverty studies. Not surprisingly then, um, income is a strong protector uh, against uh, being subjectively poor, as are household size and household composition. So after controlling for expenditure, larger households and households with more children are less likely to be subjectively poor, there's also an effect for pensioners, which is very likely uh, related to the uh, social pension in South Africa, which provides almost uh, $100 a month uh, to pensioners in South Africa. But it looks like there's an effect of that grant over and above the effect of, of income. We find that self-reported health, access to farming land, the number of employed in the household, uh, assets and quality of housing, uh, as well as basic services such as piped water at the dwelling and electricity are all protective of subjective poverty uh, over and above um, you know, at, say, at similar levels of income. Uh, carrying on in the first regression, uh, we find that uh, Africans, for a number of reasons we propose in the, in the paper, uh, are still more likely to be uh, subjectively poor, uh, controlling for all other factors, and we find the effect of relative deprivation. A, uh, the higher the level of the people in your district, uh, households are more likely to report uh, being subjectively poor. In the second model, uh, we control for these characteristics, age, education, gender, self-reported health, emotional and physical disability, and employment of the household member reporting, uh, the, the, providing the self-assessment. And we find that these uh, variables are also all significant but they don't change the significance uh, or the direction of the sign on the, on the uh, marginal effects um, from the first part of uh, regression one. So we find that it doesn't change our, our conclusions. So what do we take from this? Um, we find considerable overlap between subjective and objective measures of poverty in South Africa. 
Um, but where these measures uh, do not overlap, uh, it seems that subject subjective assessments are affected by a wide range of factors uh, in addition to uh, current income. Um, we, we think we find some evidence which suggests that um, uh, expenditure and, and income are underestimated in our household surveys, um, in particular uh, uh, per capita measures which don't take account scale economies. Uh, and it seems that uh, there's some evidence that small-scale, um, deeply rural agricultural activities are, aren't captured accurately in terms of current resources. Um, implications for, for future work on poverty in South Africa. Um, the social wage is highly protective of subjective poverty. Um, social grant contributions um, contribute to subjective poverty uh, um, reduction over and above um, their actual income contributions. Um, and finally, that income, uh, that considerations about household size and composition uh, probably deserve more attention in the South African poverty literature. Thank you.